Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Today we're going to discuss neuroendocrine tumors of the gastrointestinal tract. I have the pleasure of being with Dr. Jonathan Strasberg, assistant professor of medicine at the Lee Moffitt Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Strasberg, what are neuroendocrine tumors? Uh, neuroendocrine tumors are neoplasms and cancers that arise from endocrine cells. Mm -hmm. They can arise throughout the body. Uh, not just in uh, endocrine organs like the thyroid or adrenal gland, but also from endocrine cells, which can originate in the gastrointestinal tract, for example, enterochromaffin cells, mm -hmm. or in the pancreas, the islets of Langerhans. I see. So I understand your, your focus is in the gastrointestinal tract, so let's focus on those. Would you please go more specifically into the classifications of the GI neuroendocrine tumors? Sure. So uh, neuroendocrine tumors that originate in the gastrointestinal tract are generally known as carcinoid tumors. Mm -hmm. When we use the word carcinoid, we're also implying a relatively slow-growing cancer mm -hmm. and often hormone-producing, the main hormone being serotonin. Mm -hmm. uh, the other main category is pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, formerly known as islet cell tumors because they originated in the islets of Langerhans. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's two broad classifications. One is well-differentiated, one is poorly differentiated. Correct. What does that mean for the patient if they hear that? There's a vast difference in clinical behavior between well-differentiated mm -hmm. tumors, which tend to be very slow-growing, mm -hmm. uh, average survival is approaching a decade, even the, in the stage 4 metastatic setting, versus, versus poorly differentiated tumors, mm -hmm. which tend to uh, be similar in uh, appearance and behavior to small cell lung cancer, very aggressive, median survival is only uh, one to one and a half years. And, <clears throat> and what is the difference? Why are some tumors the well differentiated is slow growing and why are some the more aggressive poorly differentiated? Well um, there's no really good answer to that uh, but um, clearly the proliferative rate of the well differentiated versus poorly differentiated is very different mm -hmm. and by the way differentiation refers to the extent to which the cancer resembles the endocrine tissue mm -hmm. of origin whereas grade refers more to proliferative uh, measures such as the mitotic rate mm -hmm. and the K67 mm -hmm proliferative index. Now these tend to correlate closely with each other, so tumors that are well differentiated mm -hmm. tend to have a uh, low mitotic and KS67 mm -hmm. rate, whereas tumors that are poorly differentiated tend to have a much higher uh, mitotic rate. It's not a hundred percent correlation, but it's very close. I see. So basically mitosis is when the cells divide. You're correct. <clears throat> and the slower, the better for the patient. Absolutely. I see. Now, you know, since, let's focus on the well differentiated ones. Sure. Since they're so close to the actual cell, they do make a lot of proteins that we can actually check under the Correct. microscope. Would you please ex expand on that? So there are certain immunohistochemical uh, stains that are relatively uh, specific for neuroendocrine mm -hmm. tumors. Those include chromogranin, mm -hmm. synaptophysin, mm -hmm. neuron-specific enolase. Um, and then there are serum markers, mm -hmm. uh, both hormones and tumor markers. So hormones can include serotonin in the serum or the urine 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid, 5-HIAA, which is a urinary metabolite of serotonin, mm -hmm. tends to be a little bit more accurate than serum serotonin. That would be a hormone. You can also measure a tumor marker like chromogranin A um, in the serum, mm -hmm. and that's a tumor marker just like CEA is for colon cancer, mm -hmm. CA-199 for pancreatic cancer. It's not a hormone, it's not associated with any mm -hmm. clinical syndrome. Um, neuroendocrine tumors, in addition to <coughs> carcinoid tumors, in addition to serotonin, produce mm -hmm. many other vasoactive substances, and not necessarily ones that we measure, things like uh, tachykinins, calicrane, mm -hmm. substance mm -hmm. P, prostaglandins, there's a whole gamut of vasoactive substances that produce the carcinoid syndrome, the flushing mm -hmm. and the diarrhea, um, but we don't necessarily measure them all. I see. So there's another very big important uh, branching point for you all, a tumor, tumor being functional versus non-functional. Correct. What does that mean? Functional simply means hormone producing. Mm -hmm. So a tumor that produces a clinical syndrome associated with an elevated hormonal marker would be a functional tumor. So for example, a patient who comes in with a small bowel carcinoid metastatic, flushing, diarrhea, elevated urine 5-HIA, that person can be said to have a functional carcinoid tumor. I see. So there are, there are patients that could not have any symptoms at all, I see, and, and they would be considered a non-functional. Not correct. If, I mean. Uh, and these are hormonal symptoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, a patient who presents with abdominal pain from liver metastases 
uh, but no hormonal syndrome, that would not be a functional tumor. Okay. That would be a non-functional tumor. So functional means producing carcinoid syndrome for carcinoid tumors. For pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, it would be the insulinomas, glucagonomas, gastrinomas, VIPomas, etc. I got you. So I'm glad you mentioned those. Let's just go through one at a time. What sure. is an insulinoma? Insulinoma is an insulin-producing tumor, mm -hmm. uh, usually a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that produces insulin. And what would be the typical symptoms that a patient might experience? Uh, hypoglycemic symptoms, so sweats, tremors, uh, tachycardia, <coughs> syncope, um, uh, also uh, uh, increased appetite, weight gain, those are all symptoms of insulinoma. I see, and hypoglycemia meaning low blood sugar. Correct. I see, okay. What about a gastronoma? What is that? So gastronoma is a gastrin-producing tumor. It usually originates in the pancreas or duodenum. In fact, there's an area called the gastronoma triangle, bounded by the head of the pancreas, mm -hmm. duodenum, and uh, um, porta hepatis. Uh, so gastrin-producing tumors uh, create the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, mm -hmm. ZE syndrome, uh, characterized by gastric acid overproduction. Mm -hmm. So these patients get terrible acid reflux, diarrhea, peptic ulcers, often in unusual places like the esophagus or jejunum. Um, those are all symptoms of gastronoma. I see. What about a gluconoma? What is that? It's a very rare pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that produces glucagon, um, leading to some unusual symptoms. So patients often get weight loss, hyperglycemia. They can develop a very unusual rash called necrolytic migratory erythema, mm -hmm. uh, venous thrombosis, psychiatric changes. So there's some very rare manifestations associated with this rare, rare tumor. I see. Are there any tests you can perform to see whether a, a, a tumor is functional versus non-functional? Um, I don't recommend uh, doing a so-called panel of tests. Mm -hmm. um, for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, I would uh, check hormone levels based on the clinical syndrome, if one exists. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for a carcinoid tumor, we generally get uh, urine 5-HIA in all patients with mid-gut carcinoid tumors, in other words, tumors originating in the ileocecal area. Um, but uh, rectal carcinoids, for example, really don't produce any hormone. We don't check urine, 5-HIA in those. Mm -hmm. Lung, very rarely. So you really want to tailor um, uh, the hormone markers that you get to the site of origination and uh, to the clinical syndrome that the patient may be manifesting. I see. <clears throat> what is an octreo scan and when do you use that? So it's a, a radioisotope, basically, uh, that relies on the fact that neuroendocrine tumors express somatostatin receptors. So Octreoscan is indium-111 mm -hmm. conjugated to a somatostatin analog, um, uh, octreotide, and it basically tags the indium-111 to somatostatin receptor expressing tumors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that test is performed by a nuclear medicine specialist? Correct. How does that, what, what would the patient expect? They, not have, they can't eat the night before? No, patients are simply imaged four hours and 24 hours after injection of the, uh, of the compound. And what would you expect to see if the test was quote-unquote positive? Well, uh, in, it's typically positive in uh, relatively well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Um, it, it has a limited sensitivity for tumors smaller than one centimeter, so it's usually patients with larger metastatic tumors. Mm -hmm. And um, it would light up just like a, a PET scan or mm -hmm. any other. Uh, nuclear medicine scan does. At Moffitt, we actually do a fusion CT octreo scan fusion, which allows us to correlate anatomic findings mm -hmm. uh, with uh, nuclear uh, imaging. I should point out that in places that don't do it often, we see a lot of technical issues as well as misreads. Um, uh, you know, the liver and spleen have a baseline uptake, the colon mm -hmm. uptakes after 24 hours, so there's a lot of uh, potential for false positives and misinterpretation of bacteria scans. <clears throat> so if a test, quote-unquote, comes back positive, what implications does that have for the patient? Well, first, the uh, tria scan allows us to look at the whole body. Mm -hmm. um, it allows us to say whether the tumors are expressing somatostatin receptors. Potentially, they can be more sensitive to somatostatin analog therapy, okay. although we, we can't say that for sure. And uh, it's definitely a requirement if we're referring patients for uh, somatostatin-labeled uh, radiotherapy, so-called mm -hmm. peptide receptor radiotherapy, with either lutetium or yttrium. It's not re yet available in the United States, but we do send patients to Europe for that treatment. Uh, where, Switzerland or? Uh, Holland, Switzerland, mm, other nice. countries as well. Would, would an American patient's insurance pay for that? Rarely. 
So that's the PR pocket. We are starting clinical trials this year, actually, here here at Moffitt and some other centers in the United States with lutetium-177 uh, conjugated to octreotate. That's wonderful. And what about what is this endoscopic ultrasound that's used for biopsy of pancreatic masses? Do you ever use that? Yes. Um, endoscopic ultrasonography is done very commonly for detection and diagnosis of pancreatic uh, lesions. Basically, it involves inserting an ultrasound uh, through an endoscope and uh, very accurate for visualizing very small lesions in the pancreas. I see. <clears throat> now, are there any genetic implications? Should the, should the patient be genetically tested or their, or their family members be genetically tested? Most neuroendocrine tumors are sporadic. There are some rare hereditary symptoms particularly for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. There's multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, which is associated with tumors of the pancreas, parathyroid adenomas, and um, uh, pituitary adenomas. Um, relatively rare, I'd say only about 1-2% to of all pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors have MEN1. There's some other even rarer hereditary syndromes, such as uh, von hippel lindau syndrome and uh, neuroformib neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis. Yes, I <clears throat> now, patients always ask us, is there anything they can do with changing their diet or vitamins that can help alleviate some of the symptoms? Um, not that we know of. I mean, there's a lot of information out there, but none of it uh, that I would consider to be high level of evidence. Okay. <clears throat> what about having this disease and being able to work? Do your patients, or do they have the ability to continue working? Many, most uh, do. I mean, most neuroendocrine tumors are relatively slow growing. Um, symptoms can be often well controlled just with somatostatin analog therapy, which mm -hmm. is relatively non toxic. So, yes, many patients continue to work even with stage 4 disease. I see. And what do you tell your patients' family members in terms of what they need to do for support? It's too individualized. I mean, there's too many different circumstances. and. It's hard to generalize. I understand. <clears throat> Are there any general support groups that you recommend your patients to join or look into? Um, there's the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, which uh, I think offers some support groups. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm not too personally involved in support group organizations. Our Integrative Medicine Social Worker Program helps patients with that usually. I see. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.